Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Awesome. Good response. It's an interactive presentation. <laughs> um, hello. Welcome to GSV Labs, and thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Kate Newton. I am the startup manager here um, for our innovation space in San Mateo. Um, and female leaders uh, breaking new ground is always an exciting topic uh, for me personally, but we were even more excited uh, to put this event on in honor of International Women's Day and continue the celebration um, into this week. So we have two awesome panels set up for you today. Um, but before we get into that, in case you don't know anything about GSV Labs or this is your first time here, I'm going to give you the quick background. Um, we are a global innovation platform uh, working to connect all pieces of the innovation economy um, into one ecosystem. And so what that means for us is that we support entrepreneurs, accelerate startups, and connect corporations to the exponential technologies, business models, and ideas that have always made Silicon Valley special. Um, the GSV stands for Global Silicon Valley, and we often say we are working to bring Silicon Valley to the world and the world to Silicon Valley. And what we mean by this is Silicon Valley is more than just a physical location. Um, it's actually a mindset. Um, it's an innovative mindset that's brought to life some of the largest um, and most disruptive technology corporations in the world and the space where even the most outlandish ideas um, can become a reality. So our goal is to really connect the world to that mindset um, and the tools and resources behind it. Um, and we have a couple different channels to do that. One is our physical communities. We have two centers. Uh, you're sitting in one, and we also have one in Boston. Um, and we support about 200 startups across those two centers with physical resources, uh, co-working events, and the like of that. Um, but as I said, we're going global. So we are looking to uh, be involved in a kind of a bunch of different hotspots around the globe, uh, from Sao Paulo to Paris to London to Shenzhen. Um, but we also recognize that there's a limitation here, that not everybody is going to be able to walk into one of our physical locations. Um, and in recognizing that limitation, uh, we have built and launched a digital platform called Passport um, earlier in January. So this includes a world-class mentor network. Um, it includes investor connections, hundreds of tools and templates uh, that founders can use to do anything from help perfect their pitch deck uh, to setting up HR for the first time. Um, and we also have over $500,000 in discounts and free services um, to kind of help startups burn less cash up front. If you haven't checked it out, please go to gsvlabs.com passport my shameless plug for the evening. Um, and check it out. You can make a free account. You can see everything that's going on. Um, and we're really excited to see how this will develop. Since we launched in January, we have almost 1,000 online members um, over across 20 countries, I believe. So as I mentioned, we are hoping to support entrepreneurs. But we know that resources are not distributed equally. Um, and we would not be doing our job correctly if we weren't actively identifying and uplifting underrepresented founders. Um, and female founders are a big part of this group. Um, and so, just to get a lay of the land uh, before we start, I'm just going to throw some quick fun facts at you. You could tell me if you think they're fun later. <laughs> um, so the basics here, pretty equal. In the US, we have about 51% women, 49% men. The last equal statistic you'll see tonight. <laughs> um, and approximately 3.3% of those men are named John. It's the uh, most popular male name. In the United States, we have more CEOs named John than we have CEOs that are female. <laughs> and if that doesn't shock you enough, also more Davids, followed by uh, some other you know, popular male names. Mm. So you might think to yourself, this seems like a national problem. Surely Silicon Valley is doing something about it, moving the needle. So last year, of the $130 billion that venture capitalists gave out, approximately 2.2% went to female founders. Of the other 98%, 76% of that went to teams that were all male founded. Um, and then about 12% with at least one female founder. So we know women are underfunded. Um, but we also know that women outperform. So we have a lot of awesome statistics around um, startups founded or co-founded by women uh, perform better over time and actually generate 10% more in cumulative revenue. So there's a huge opportunity here, and a lot of progress has been made, um, but we still have work to do. And so we couldn't think of a better way to, to look at this changing landscape than to hear 
directly from some of the, the badass women uh, in investment and founding companies right now. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Susie Hahn. Um, Susie is going to lead our first panel here. She is has taught entrepreneurship at Northwestern University. She has been in the GSV family for over four years and serves as chief of staff um, to our chair, Michael Moe. And so you're in very good hands. Oh, we can bring her up. Yeah, all the first panelists can also come up as well. <laughs> Thank you, Kate, and hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Okay, more, more enthusiastically, like seriously, come on. I know, I know it's Monday, I know everyone's tired, but let's be happy. Um, well, first of all, I'm really thankful for this opportunity to, to be up here with these amazing women um, who are much cooler than me. Um, so I'm very thankful for this experience, and thank you all for joining us today. I wanted to spend time today to talk about um, you know, their experiences in BC, especially as a woman in tech, and you know how that's transformed their career and um, kind of any insights that they want to share um, to any people in this audience today. So um, before we get started, I'd love everyone to give a quick introdu introduction of themselves, you know, one minute quick background about wh who they are, wh what they've done, and you know, um, where they came from. So Lindsay, you want to start? Hi, I'm Lindsay. I work for Starbridge Venture Capital, and we're an early stage fund investing in space technology, which is pretty different, I think, from most venture funds here in Silicon Valley. And prior to that, I used to work at NASA Ames Research Center in project management. So my whole career has pretty much focused around the space industry. Hi, my name is Julia Stiglitz. I'm a partner at GSV Accelerate, which is an early stage uh, venture fund focusing on the education and talent market. Uh, before that, I was a vice president at Coursera, where I joined about a month after the company launched. And wore a lot of different hats. Um, and then before that, I was at Google and then Teach for America. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Whitney. I am a partner, Whitney Sales. My last name is actually Sales. Um, <laughs> I'm a partner at Accelerate Ventures. Uh, we're a B2B SaaS accelerator that focuses on go-to-market. Sales fits in really well there. So uh, before that, I have served as VP of sales in several early stage companies, basically, in helping the companies get to their first million, and ran a startup sales consultancy working with early stage founders. Um, so that's my background. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Kathy. Uh, I work for a venture fund called 1955 Capital. Um, we focus on kind of frontier technologies that really uh, try to address some of the, the biggest challenges in, in the environment, in clean tech, sustainability, agriculture, as well as healthcare. Um, and we have an eye to think about how we can bring these technologies to uh, many emerging markets and, and markets uh, abroad, because oftentimes we see those are uh, the places that are worst affected by some of these issues. Um, so my personal background, um, I've been in the finance industry um, s for all of my career. And previously, before venture capital, I was in private equity and working in Asia. And so I got to see a lot of the on-the-ground on the issues around the environment in, in countries like China. So that's how I ended up here. Great. Well, you know, I'd first like to start off by asking the question to the panel, um, you know, what makes women-led startups such a compelling opportunity? And, you know, is there a secret sauce or... Or, or you know, what is their secret sauce, or is there a secret sauce to you know, um, you know, the business that 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 they've created? So, Julie, I want to start with you because you know, um, you know, GSV Accelerates founder Deborah Quazzo is a huge advocate for women. At the summit, we do the you know, ladies' lunch, which which you know highlights you know the power of women every single year at the summit. So, you know, I'd love for you to start and kick off and you know weigh in on on that question. Yeah. So, um, I think it's important for entre entrepreneurs to be close to the problems that they're trying to solve. Um, women currently drive about 70 to 80 percent of all consumer purchasing decisions. So that's about seven trillion dollars that women are making a decision about. Um, and so when you think about uh, the companies that you want to fund or the problems that you want to solve, you're going to be looking for founders that are making those sort of decisions. Um, and if you're not funding women, there's a whole set of ideas that you're not going to be seeing or not going to be understanding and that you're going to be missing out on. 
And so I don't know if it's, if it's a secret sauce in terms of something particular about female leadership versus male leadership. I look at it more as there's a tremendous market opportunity um, and, and the people that are going to see that, that opportunity are the people that are closest to it. Um, and with women driving 70 to 80% of consumer purchasing decisions, they might be closest to it. That's a great answer. Um, yeah, yeah, I just want to piggyback off of Julia's point because I think you know, for, for us, we invest in um, companies with, with a mission, right? And I think a lot of times because the fact that a lot of women really care about you know, their communities, the environment, their family, how to create um, you know, a better environment for the next generation, um, they're really, they have really insightful uh, ideas on uh, how, how to solve these problems. And so um, I, I think some of the things that we've come across is like, for example, in the textile industry, like apparel, women are really conscientious about you know, manufacturing that, that's less polluting, right? Or, or thinking about closing the loop in terms of recycling or, or around topics like food waste. And so I think that passion and that, you know, like, like Julia said, being really close to the problem and, and really driving their, uh, their motivation in solving it is, is a part of what's special because they're out to create a legacy and that makes, you know, a really pa powerful company. Just to jump in here as well, uh, on the B2B SaaS side, one of the things that actually makes female founders uh, particularly good is that uh, one of the big issues around B2B in general is a lot of them are founded by technical and product-led founders. Um, sales and product and technology don't typically go hand in hand. Women on average actually make better salespeople. Um, their sales and conversion rates are 11% higher than men. Um, not to com compare men and women, but um, a founder who can sell is actually one of the ways to drive revenue quickly within an organization. And so it's the reason you see capital efficiency in early stage companies actually much higher. It's about 23%. So just an interesting stat. And just diversity of thought, because we all have different backgrounds. So the way that we approach a problem is all going to be different, like especially in the space industry. Most people are engineers, but then they don't really look at the business side. So just having a diverse set of people to look at a problem, I think, creates the best uh, company or whatever is you're trying to do. So I guess on a scale of one to 10, how would you currently rate the you know, resources out there to support women entrepreneurs and female-led startups right now? And, and, and off of that, how, how do we improve that margin? It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, particularly in the early stages, which is where I'm focused. Um, if you think about how you raise money in the early stages, it's really informal networks, especially before you get to um, institutional investors. You're raising money from angels. And so you need to have a network of wealthy individuals that are doing angel investing in order to even get to the place where you're ready to take on an ins institutional round. And so the reliance on those sort of informal networks, which you know, traditionally have been men and still are majority men, makes it really hard for someone who doesn't have those networks to break into. And it, that, that's women, that's, that's underrepresented minorities. There's a, there's a lot of people that are outside of, um, outside of that. Uh, just to jump in here, uh, the other thing that's interesting is angel networks, for example, only 30% of angel investing is done by women, but if you look at by 2020, personal wealth is gonna be 50-50. Um, so it's a really interesting stat. We need to get more women actually angel investing. Um, I was talking actually uh, in, the, in the speaker room a little bit before, and um, uh, we need more water cooler conversations. I know that sounds really cheesy, but yeah. women don't have the same types of conversations around investing that men do from young ages. And so it needs to be a conversation around financial literacy, around investing, around managing our own wealth, around being the breadwinners in our families, um, to actually start leveling the playing field around it. And those are resources just on the investing side, but starting to have those conversations around how to run a capital efficient business and businesses in general is really one of the ways that we can actually start to move things forward. Yeah, I, I agree. I, th I think we're building more resources on the formal side um, with, you know, in conversations like these, um, you know, women-focused events and, and foundations, but I think when it comes to the informal setting where it's just so much easier for men to network and make friends and just casually have contacts that later in life really pay off, and for women to, like, break into that, I, I think one of the things I, I've thought about is, you know, with my my 
a few good friends who are male and in the investing industry, I just want to call on them to like kind of help us out in that res respect, right? If we're going to a network networking session, you know, have them actively, you know, not talk about sports all the time, just actively be an ally and, and think about how, how can I, they introduce us to um, other people in, in their network, uh, men and women, and just create an environment that's, that's more inclusive and not, um, not favoring a particular culture or segment. I mean, there's a lot more resources, I think, coming up like this past year, the Female Founders Office Hours. I think they s just recently started for, um, for like top uh, women VCs, started a group to help give office hours to female founders. And I think that's been a good source that just started this past year, just seeing with um, how diversity has played into it and like we need more women founders. So, and the resources like you're saying, like they're not great um, but also just these kind of events are great to like find and meet other fellow females and then like tell each other about other events, like other tech events that are happening around Silicon Valley and like go together to these events because in those events, that's where you really need to like show the female representation. And in the beginning, I was often the only female in the room and like it can be a bit jarring and especially intimidating but I kind of made it my mission that every time I went to one of these events I would have to talk to at least one to two people before I could leave. So just making that my mission and somehow like I felt like I ended up meeting and talking to like the right person so that's what I did in the beginning and how I ended up getting into the position that I am now. So I definitely just encourage more women to get out there and go to these tech events because they need more representation. <laughs> what about you, Julia? Uh, my experience has been a, a little bit different. My, my current fund, there's three partners. Two of them are female. The managing partner is female. And then at Coursera, one of the two founders was female. And then uh, actually over half of the executive team was female. <laughs> so it, uh, it, it, was, it was a bit different. But one of the lessons that I took from that and something that I think about a lot as I work with early stage companies is the importance of thinking about diversity and getting diversity at the very early stages of building a, a company that you, you, in your first you know, half dozen people, you need to have representation. Um, of a diverse set of individuals. And then if you don't, it gets harder and harder. Um, that it becomes, the, your DNA of a company is essentially formed in those early stages. Um, and if diversity isn't baked in, it's hard to catch up on that. Um, it, it, it's particularly hard to try to attract, if you don't have any women on your team and you're trying to, you know, 12 people or so, it gets harder and harder to attract some. Um, so, uh, I think my experience has been a bit different in that I've actually mostly worked in environments that were, were at least on the teams that I was on, predominantly female. Um, but uh, there's lessons that I took from that that I think other companies can, can learn from. Uh, so I have primarily worked for male, com male <laughs> founded companies. Um, and then my partner is, is male as well. Uh, but I was lucky enough that he brought me on as the first partner in the fund. Um, so... It's definitely, I, I ran into the same experiences you run into, um, where I'd be one of a handful of women in a room, and my associate is a six foot five male, and so I bring him to the room, and people will talk to him and not talk to me, um, and try and pitch him versus pitching me. Um, so it's a really interesting dynamic, um, and trying to establish my own authority in the room. So some of the ways I've navigated it uh, personally is I've done a lot of phone calls versus in-person meetings. I found those actually to be uh, more informative. I also lead with respect versus play. Um, with women, I interact in a very different way than I actually interact with men. Um, I don't want there to be anyone to misconstrue my interactions for flirting or trying to be too friendly. I smile less around them. I know it's we don't necessarily want to talk about things we're doing differently, but you have to. Um, because if you can be overly friendly, it might be misconstrued because there is that, that issue there. Um, and so I really do try and, and lead in a different way um, in my interactions with men. So nothing is, is seen the wrong way. Yeah, I feel like we have to put so much more thought into these like details. Um, and I've definitely been 
on more than one occasion been mistaken for like the secretary, right? So <laughs> um, yeah, I would say like in my experience, one of the toughest things is, y like you said, like establishing your own authority and credibility. Um, so in our industry, it tends to be very kind of hard tech focused and in, in the hard tech STEM industrial sectors, you definitely see a lot more male representation and oftentimes th these founders are, you know, very academic and they're, they, they tend to be older. They come from very, you know, um, uh, well-recognized institutions. So they, they already have so much more kind of experience and, and authority coming into a conversation. And so how do you, y you know, as a senior associate with kind of no science background, kind of how do you balance that dynamic? It's, it's something that I had to learn. Um, and uh, one of the things is just, it's a mindset adjustment, I think, um, because as an investor, right, we, at the end of the day, we, we write the check. And so in a way you have to think, you have to convince yourself that you're in a position of power because you decide, you know, whether this is an investment that's worth your time. And so thinking about ways to kind of mentally be uh, at a place where you're kind of on par with them is, is really important. And I feel like that's half of the game is, is really mental. I think things are, are changing. Like I, I see um, founders who are coming to, to me, to, um, to my managing partner, and they want a female on their board. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they're more excited about taking funding from us. Um, they get the importance of diversity and they're trying to build it in from the beginning. Um, so, and I, I saw this also as an executive at Corsair, what, you know, and while we were 50% representation, people were coming from companies that, 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 that didn't have that. And I found that leaning heavily into my own leadership style, um, which was you know, very far from like an alpha male leadership style, like was my differentiator and was why my, my team um, resonated with me so much. So I think it's, and I hope it's starting to change. And I, and I think leaning into those differences is, 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 is what is your competitive advantage. Um, and I, so I, I think it's starting to change. Yeah, definitely in the space industry, we have a lot of catching up to do, but I have seen it slowly, slowly change, and there's been a lot more females popping up, which is very positive. <laughs> but, I, but I think it really does come from the founders. Like, I, you know, we're also, we've been raising a fund. I don't think it's going to come from the LPs who we're raising funds from. Um, I think it's going to come from founders who, as they're raising funds, are going to want certain things from their investors. Um, and diversity is, is something that you can look for and ask for. So like that brings up a very interesting point. So about diversity and, and how that makes businesses function better. Because I think you had a very unique experience at Coursera, which is a very diverse organization. So um, I guess tangibly, like how have you seen diversity help companies function better in the long term? You know, what, what, what are some you know, um, key points you, you observe as investors or, you know, as board members when you see diverse companies versus non-diverse companies, if any? Um, I think I'll take a crack at this. I think for us, because a big part of our investment mandate is to look for kind of the international angle. And so knowing other markets, knowing other consumer segments who will have different, you know, preferences and the modes of operation versus kind of the US domestic market is, is really core to the success of our startups. And so we, we definitely actively look to bring on advisors who have an expertise in a different market. And, and that type of diversity um, you can often see in, um, in, in experience, but also in, in like gender, in that they, they provide a, just a different view on um, how a different population or a different segment of the market uh, would react to a certain product. I, I would agree with that. In, in general, I think the more opinions you have in a room, the more diverse opinions you have in the room, the, you drive a more creative organization. So um, I, when we look at, I mean, we have a pretty diverse portfolio. We're in B2B SaaS and we have 30% uh, female founded companies in our portfolio, which is pretty phenomenal when you look at the stats. Um, and so, the thing you look around around diversity is like there's certain things that come from a mindset around it. So um, when you have people who are coming from different backgrounds or bringing a different perspective, they're bringing new ideas. So uh, when you have even older founders, for example, who are first time founders, they're bringing a very different perspective than younger founders. And so you can look at gender or race, um, but there's also age um, that plays a role and each of those can play its own role and um, the, the ideas that come to the table. 
Yeah, so I, I definitely think it, it can help a company's business strategy in terms of being able to empathize with various user groups, um, and, and you can build that into your strategy. I also think it, 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 it can help them be really thoughtful about what kind of company they're trying to build, and that's something that will help everyone. So things like maternity leave or paternity leave policies or um, having a mother's room, I mean, which legally you do at a certain point, but making that place a nice place, <laughs> which you don't legally need to do. Um, uh, so there's all sets of, thing, uh, sets of things that will make an environment better um, for different sets of people, which I think has spillover effects onto everybody. Do you have any comment, Lindsay? I agree with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess now, now turning this conversation more back to you and advice and lessons learned from your careers, um, what has been one or two of the you know most helpful things you've encountered over your careers that's helped you succeed as a female? I think a lot of it comes from you know finding a support group and a mentor network, but um, you know aside from that, like what like what has been most helpful to you? Mine's gonna be a little bit out there, but I think honestly the thing that has helped me the most is playing ultimate frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> so I play ultimate frisbee at a pickup game at Stanford on Sundays, but like I, as one of the only females there, there's maybe usually one to three of us who play, but just like being able to interact in that like informal setting, I think it helps a lot with your confidence. And then just talking with everybody else and like, which are mostly males, but seeing like where their backgrounds are and like you get a really diverse kind of thought from that group. And I mean, for me, when I was first getting into VC, um, I met Li Jiang who used to work at GSB and like that's how I, I guess ended up here now is because I met Li at Frisbee. So just kind of talking to everybody that you meet and just going to these informal things and doing something like even outside of the bubble of tech, I think is really helpful. Something that I found really helpful is having a career wing woman. So I have a couple of career wing women and when I get invited to a networking event or a dinner, I'll email them and ask them if my like career wing woman could come with me, which both makes the dinner way more fun <laughs> and it allows her to expand her network as well. Um, she'll get invited to a summit and she'll ask if I can go. Um, it's, she'll, I'll get uh, recruiters reaching out to me about something and I'll forward them to her. So um, I have a couple career wing women and it's actually been tremendously valuable um, and I, 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 it's something I encourage everyone to have. Uh, so one thing I've done, and I, it goes back to network because I think we're all talking about a little bit about the people uh, in our lives. But one of the things I found is the type of format that I actually do well in um, and optimizing to only spend my time in those types of formats um, so that the time I'm spending is effective. Um, for example, I don't do well in large networking events. I actually enjoy one-on-one -on -one time and smaller group events. So I don't go to large networking events. I don't spend my time that way because that's not how I'm going to connect with people. Um, and so really being thoughtful about how I'm spending my time so I'm actually building true connections with people. Yeah, actually, I have a similar strategy in, in that I'm, um, I, th I think something that really helped is that thinking about what leadership style suits you. Because, you know, we're all women, but we all still are very different. We have different personalities and different um, strategies work differently for us. And so when I really took the time to think about you know, what works for me and what doesn't, then um, I think it's, it's important to take that time to discover that for yourself and then formulate a strategy around it. And so for me, I, I think, you know, one-on-ones are definitely more, um, more fruitful because I think in those interactions, um, you actually learn a lot about your own style. Um, and it's a calm environment where you actually are really paying attention to the other person and having a really good connection back and forth. Um, another thing is that I really like kind of the mentorship role because it's kind of a risk-free risk environment for me, right? I'm, I'm talking to someone who wants advice or just wants feedback, and so I don't have any pressure to, like, you know, show off or really um, have to come off a certain way, but I can be very sincere in the way I interact with them and provide feedback. And in that process, I'm, I'm actually practicing, you know, my own pitch. And so just food for thought on in terms of, how you can find an opportunity that makes you comfortable, but in that process, learn a lot about your style. So you all are some number of years into your career. 
what advice would you give to your 21-year-old self who's just starting out post-college, entering into the workforce? Go with the flow. <laughs> So two pieces of advice that I would give it would definitely find mentors. I mean, this is advice that a lot of people give, but it's but it's incredibly important. So people who genuinely care about you, want to see you progress, um, don't have interest beyond your own uh, your own well being and progression in your career. So mentors are extremely valuable. Um, on a more tactical level, uh, and this is especially true for women in in the early stages of their career. Um, avoid taking notes at meetings, avoid being the one who plans the parties. There's a whole set of office work that, that women um, are, are almost always the ones who do that nobody values and takes away from the things that really do that they really do value, like sharing a strategic idea or, um, or you know, selling on a project. So I think just being mindful of that, because there is, even in, in extremely supportive work environments, there still is bias, and it shows up in subtle ways, like who you ask to take notes in a meeting. And while it, uh, that little act seems like nothing, it adds up. And so focusing on the things that matter and not doing the things that, um, that, that don't matter just because people are asking you to. Uh, so this goes a little bit on the mentor front, and I have two things. Um, one on the mentor front, find people who push your boundaries. Um, I've had, I've been lucky enough to actually have friends who challenge the way I think quite a bit, and it's caused me to actually move myself forward in the 10x type of capacity. Um, it's more from a friend perspective than technically a mentor, but because um, we do it for each other, so it's, I guess that's kind of the wing woman piece. But um, I would definitely recommend surrounding yourself with people who push you and challenge you, um, not just necessarily mentor you. Um, and then the second piece uh, is really around don't apologize for being strong. Um, it, it may not necessarily come off the way people want or like the way you want it to, but in reality, uh, don't, don't apologize for it. Just realize that you need to adjust. Um, uh, adjust and don't take it personal. Uh, it's just, it's, it's how you're marketing yourself and then you can just move forward. It's not, it's not personal. Um, I, I think when I was young and just starting out, um, I, I avoided kind of the social setting because my firm, I, I worked in a very traditional kind of finance institution in Asia, right? So, um, you know, the firm was stacked with, with kind of male leadership and whenever we had kind of social events or, or Monday after hours, it's all very, you know, sports focused and I, I kind of just avoided it like the plague. Um, and I, I was perfectly fine kind of heads down just working on the core skill set and never really making myself known to, to my firm. I think that's a, it's just like a huge disadvantage because in order to have allies, in order to have mentors who are willing to fight for you, you have to let them know you and that means you have to show up, right? And so even though these events are awkward and, and you, you just, you feel like it's unfair that you have to talk about a subject that is not in your interest, but you know, all the guys want to talk about, but I think having, just like putting yourself there, elbowing your way through um, is a really important first step. And, and once people get to know you, it's just so much easier for them to, to be on your side. I cool. think it's really important to always like try new things and like push boundaries and your comfort zone. And like, because if you don't try new things and you don't know if you're gonna enjoy it or if you're gonna just like it, and like if you don't like it, then you can just like stop doing it and then move on to the next new thing. And maybe that next new thing you'll like really enjoy and that'll help um, form your career path. Cool. Um, do we have time for questions? Yeah, do you wanna take some questions? Any questions? Yeah, syrup. So I'm an engineer by trade, so I'm going to ask, like I heard some of the comments around like the environment being too technical, so what needs to happen to maybe get more women into this technical side of things to maybe like put them in that where if they can talk the engineering and product, et cetera, of which are some of the struggles I heard you guys talk about in like, oh, the environment being too techy or something. 
I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily too techy. It's just that it's very male dominated. Um, and so it's creating an environment where, where uh, it's more inclusive in the conversation. So um, sorry, just to correct for me at least, it wasn't that it was, it was too technical in conversation. It was more that it's just very male dominated. When you walk into a room and it's a handful of women, it's just a very different conversation than it is when it's a group like this actually. So Yeah, I, mean, I, I actually think if it was just focused on the technical, the substance of the work, I think there probably wouldn't be very many problems. I think it's that, that, that it's not just focused on the substance of the work, that it's focused on all these other things that may be more or less inclusive. Yeah, and I think in order to change that, a big part is just, you know, the HR function, right, the recruiting process and the people who are involved in, in actually recruiting. Um, I, I think we all have this tendency to recruit people who are like us, and so when you already have a very male-dominated, you know, the default is just to recruit another guy who you feel like is your buddy. Um, to really actively challenge that mindset and, you know, be very objective and intentional in bringing on females into the organization, I think, really means that the, the recruiting function has to take that on. And there's concrete things that I've seen um, engineering organizations do, like require that for every um, engineering hire or any hire within a company that, that in your final set of, uh, you have to have at least one female in your, in your panel of people that you're interviewing. Um, or same thing as you're looking at, at people who are up for promotion, that you're, that you're actively considering it. Um, and having explicit conversations around bias and unconscious bias and that that's something that's real. Um, and just making that out there in the open as something that exists um, and you know, forcing teams to confront it as part of the hiring process. I was uh, going to add in regards to it, the technical event specifically, just including the women in the conversation. Like an invitation is amazing. Um, I mean, not every woman's going to, especially introverts, are going to shove their way in. Um, it takes a lot of like guts to do that. And so something you can do is just invite them in. We, we've definitely had a lot of issues with this with past conferences at for a space where the panels are like, you go to these conferences and it's basically all the same exact speakers and they're all male dominated and out of maybe like 200 panelists, there's like 11 women speakers and that would be like on the high end. So just being mindful that if your company or whoever is invited to speak on a panel, maybe promote um, one of the women on your team to speak on the panel because we need to see the representation up there. Hi, I'm Terry Givens. I uh, used to be the provost at Menhill College. Now I'm an entrepreneur. Um, but one of the things um, I was wondering about is if you had a chance to talk to higher ed leaders and we could change some of the things we're doing, at a, including at a place like Menlo that is a business college, what would you say we should be doing to help women um, advance as founders? Oh, these are all sensitive questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, again, like I think representation really matters. And so having them see female investors and other female founders who have succeeded um, and having them and get mentors from them or, or at least uh, conversations um, and starting early. I mean, I think that there's a lot of people that, that might not think that starting a company is for them um, when, they, when they first started. It might not be why they applied. But if they see examples of people that look like them that are doing great and that are succeeding in that arena, it might open them up to whole new possibilities of what they could do that they wouldn't otherwise know about. So I think starting early and, 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 and um, finding people who, who uh, represent the diversity in the, in the college. Um, I, th I think from a, maybe it's like from a curriculum perspective, um, because I, I had the chance to go to business school, and so I think one of the things that was really useful in, in, in kind of that business education is showing that there are different leadership styles and different ways that you can exert influence and power, and that kind of the aggressive A-type male leadership is not the only way to go about it. Um, I, I think there are courses that really lay those strategies out for you, and giving women just a tool set to think about what works for them, and and just being very multiple about it, I think is, is actually quite effective. Hello, um, oh, sorry. So I appreciated all of your um, kind of input regarding 
having uh, things be like more numerically equal and talking about um, kind of like content. But I was just wondering if you guys have any thoughts on uh, how like men can be more mindful of maybe like nonverbal communication stuff as well. Like you guys addressed um, not like talking about sports so much, which is like traditionally a men's type thing, but you know what I mean? Yeah, so I mean, th some of the concrete things that I mentioned, so um, like who's taking notes in a meeting, it just sounds so small, but like it really does matter. Um, and actually making everyone aware of, of why it's important that different people take notes in a meeting. Because when, it, when you're taking notes in a meeting, you're not actively participating and that you really care that everybody actively participates. Um, if you're in a meeting looking at who's talking and who's not talking, um, and if you see someone who hasn't spoken um, and maybe hasn't been able to create the room for themselves, creating room for them and saying, you know, at Susie or whoever it is, I, I know that you haven't said anything. Is there, is there anything you want to add to the conversation? Because um, some people need that in order to step in. Um, and then same thing with some of the other things that, you know, happen in an, in, in an office that are some of the, as I mentioned, the sort of thankless duties that, that women tend to take on, um, but don't really accelerate someone's career, um, like planning the going away party or, um, you know, there's a, a whole set of things that happen. Um, and, uh, and making sure that, again, that it's not always, you know, sometimes it will be, but not all the time. Um, and so just being mindful of, of who's doing what um, and is there a space for other people's voices and, um, and perspectives to be shared? Uh, something I know one team uh, that I, I've worked with does is they actually round table their team meetings on who's leading it. So each person's leadership style gets to come out. I thought that was a really interesting way to actually give, uh, give voice to the people who are leading the conversation. Um, that was one thing I've seen, seen done. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, all of the above. Um, just like personally, I, I've always found it difficult to kind of jump into a conversation. I think for some reason, men, men are a little bit more comfortable doing that. And, and uh, you know, I work with a team that is very, very supportive about, you know, helping, helping me advance and, and mindful about, you know, women's participation. But I, I even find that sometimes they don't realize that they're constantly talking and there's just no way for me to jump into the conversation. <laughs> And, and I have to make it known to them that like, hey, I'm really trying to put in the effort, but you realize I have to like literally, you know, interrupt. yeah, interrupt you or like y try to yell over you. And that's just not the way I operate. And so I think for men to kind of realize that women are, are different in that sense and just, yeah, creating more space. I think I'm really lucky with um, my team because I'm the only female on our team and everybody is a much older male, but whenever we're on calls or we have meetings with other people and like my boss consistently or somebody else on my team, like they consistently will realize, oh, Lindsay's been quiet for a while and they'll be like, Lindsay, do you have anything to add or any questions? So that's been really helpful and it's really nice to have our bosses like be very cognizant of um, if we're saying something or like interacting in the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I have to add to that. When I first joined GSV, I was the, you know, the youngest on the team by probably a decade, and you know, all of our senior partners were men. But you know, they had daughters, and I think they they kind of brought me into the family like that, which has really helped me kind of become immersed um, and really kind of forced me to grow much faster as well. So I just I luckily had a similar experience to you. And the last thing I'll uh, I'll say is um, asking questions like that. Like that's you know that's yeah. a great question. And um, <laughs> and that you know that'll come up with you know uh, women employees on your team or, or it just understanding their experience and, and how they're doing and um, getting their feedback. But it's also it's a great great question. Do we have time for one more question? Or are we out? Just one more. Okay. <laughs> what advice would you give female founders when they are pitching to a lot of male investors in the room and maybe there's sometimes maybe a female partner? Is there any advice do you give like? Do we change, you know, uh, a little bit of how we pitch or on certain slides of a pitch deck that we tend to be more, you know, emphasize on? Can you give us advice? That'd be great. Uh, my advice would be lear lead with the experience in which you can put the investor in the shoes of the buyer so they understand the problem and can empathize with the problem before you pitch it because they may not necessarily have context around it. So uh, depending on what your product is, that's what one of the pieces of advice I would give is, is really lead with trying to get that person and that empathized buyer experience so they can actually understand how it's solving the pain point. 
um, know your numbers inside and out. I mean, I think this would be for, for anyone, um, but I think particularly for, for um, women who are pitching, um, because that's something that if you don't, it, it will it, it'll reflect even worse on you, I think, as a female than, uh, than as a male. But just know your numbers inside and out. Unfortunately, I haven't really had any female female founders pitch me in the space industry as of yet, but hopefully that Invitation. will Invitation? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if anybody has any sort of space technology related, we'd love to hear from you. But in general, for the space industry at least, uh, definitely know your market and who your customers are, because the tech is great, but you need to have customers. <laughs> I would say, like, probably more on how to get to that point where you're really comfortable at pitching is that um, much much like we, we tell startups like fail often fail fast like I think you should do that when it comes to the pitch right and, and try to do it earlier and just having a lot of practice and I think one way to go about it is pitch to investors who maybe are not in your direct vertical that they don't really like you know nothing's on the hook you're not at risk of losing anything and so you have an opportunity to really practice or, or pick to pitch to investors who are maybe they would invest in, in what you're doing, but at a later stage so that they can give you really valuable feedback. Um, I think it really is kind of the confidence in your pitch and you just need you know, a certain amount of practice before you, you pitch to the investors who you think are really matter to you. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, I want to bring up the next panel um, and I'll also introduce the next moderator who is my wonderful colleague, Tara. Um, so Tara has been at GSV Labs probably as long I, uh, as I've been at GSV. Um, she runs, um, she, she, she leads enterprise innovation and works with a lot of GSV Labs. Can you turn off my mic? Slater, I'm trying to introduce Tara who's cool. Um, so, so Tara does a lot of in, uh, enterprise innovation work with GSV Labs. Um, she's also great at trivia and also great at karaoke, so. <laughs> By great at karaoke, she means I'm good at swaying in the background while <laughs> our colleagues sing karaoke. Um, so I'd like to invite my panelists up as well. So first I wanna say thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to, to be hosting this event in honor of International Women's Day. Uh, something else we like to talk about at GSV Labs is the concept of pioneers and mavericks. Pioneers being those that have paved the way for the pioneers, um, the innovators and the entrepreneurs that are pushing the boundaries of technology and innovation today. Um, so with that, I wanna pass the mic to these pioneers um, to tell us a little bit about themselves, their companies, and what inspired them to be an entrepreneur. Hi. So my name is Maki Kaplinski. Uh, firstly, I'm mother of three children, and I work as a CEO and co-founder of NFT, Next Future Transportation. We develop autonomous flying car. Uh, it's a car that drives on the road like a car, vertical takeoff, open wings, and fly. Um, this is my third um, startup. I have happened to have established um, companies in different countries each time. Uh, first one in Israel, I ran the company for 10 years. Uh, second one in Japan, uh, it was a pioneer of IoT platform. We sold the company to GE Digital uh, in 2017. Hi, I'm Han May. I am CEO and founder of Empowerly. Empowerly is a online marketplace for one-on-one -on -one college and career advising. And I've always been really passionate about education. Before starting Empowerly, I did Teach for America. Um, I currently am on leadership at an education nonprofit in San Francisco. Um, before that, I did Goldman Sachs and I attended UC Berkeley where I studied business. I'm Jennifer Ernst. I'm CEO of Tivic Health. We are a bioelectronic device company, and this means we're replacing pharmaceuticals with electricity. Our first product in January received our FDA clearance for sinus pain relief, a little handheld device that's used on the outside of the sinus passages um, and delivers phenomenal levels of relief from pain and congestion. Um, so this is my second time around. My first company was a um, 
was reinventing the way we manufactured electronics. So I took that one from half sorry, eight people to about a half billion market cap in less than five years. Uh, so when we saw talk about building billion dollar companies, I got halfway there. <laughs> got to get this one all the way. <laughs> I love that too. Um, so something I want to draw attention to is you're all innovating in highly regulated industries, um, transportation, education, healthcare. Um, what gave you the confidence to take on that challenge? Um, let's start with Jennifer. Well, the easy answer is naivete. <laughs> um, actually, I, I had come across this technology, this very novel technology that needed a home and needed to be brought to market, and I could see um, just the market is massive. I mean, the market for pharmaceuticals in this segment is a $130 billion segment. So my co-founder has deep FDA class three medical device experience, and I knew what I brought to the table was the experience of growing, um, knowing how to put teams together, knowing what the value of marketing, um, and all in all, like we were just a perfectly complementary set. set. Um, it was an interesting change to go from tech to med device because the, the things I didn't realize at the time were things like it takes three months to get on the FDA's calendar to have them answer a single question. And this is the kind of stuff that sets the pace. Um, but nonetheless, I promised my investors three years to market and we are hitting that target. So a med device in three years and on less than $3 million. Yeah, so I actually was doing Teach for America and then I decided to start Empowerly and it was a bit like either now or never because I felt like I was in you know a good position to take on some risk you know I wasn't married I didn't have to pay off mortgage I didn't have any kids and so I felt like you know I can take a few years and really just start a company um, and the reason why I started Empowerly is because it's something that I personally wish I had had over the last 10 years of my life as I applied to dozens of schools and dozens of internships and jobs, and so what we do is we actually match every student to their counselor of best fit based on like their personality, pain points, where they're applying, their academics, and more, and all the college and career advising is done online via our software, and they also receive personalized recommendations to optimize their college or job applications, and I, you know, felt like a lot of the people around me, like just in my general network, were amazing on the supply side to be these college and career counselors. And I just started talking to them all and recruiting them. And I started you know, doing a bunch of marketing, um, like blogging and hosting events and paid ads and just kind of quit my job and went for it. So um, developing a flying car has been my dream for a long time. Um, First of all, I see huge potential of this uh, 3D transportation. Um, what this air mobility can give to the demands of uh, better quality of life. Um, with this, uh, people can live and work wherever they want. And I saw that space above us is not being used. And I see great potential. Number two, I see um, once in 100 years of opportunities with automotive industry in transition. Um, the whole industry moving towards EV, some of the traditional players being late, or um, they're looking for the next big thing. Uh, number three, technology being improved. I think I see it's possible, and I was confident I have access to the world-class engineers. Um, uh, who can make this happen. And I'm very fortunate to have my um, engineers in Israel uh, who have experience in uh, autonomous um, UAV, or, um, unmanned aerial vehicle, or drone fields. And um, they are very excited to solve this problem. Can I, can I yeah. add one? Uh, it goes back to something that was said on the earlier panel, is the point about role models. Because when I was at a point when I was um, deciding whether or not to form this company, I ended up getting invited to an event from Astia Angels, and this this is an organization that focuses on women and now increasingly on underrepresented uh, classes of entrepreneurs broadly. And being at that event and seeing other women and seeing other entrepreneurs and seeing women my age who had started companies, who were founding, who were running, um, one of them had grown to a pretty sizable company. So that was one of those um, moments when you kind of go, okay, well, they look a lot like me. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're doing it. I, this isn't crazy. This isn't a ridiculous idea. And I think you know, the question about education, 
goes to that role model thing because for a woman, for example, to see, I can do that, they may only need to see one or two, mm -hmm. but for the rest of the ecosystem that needs to support them to believe I, that she can do that, you have to have seen an abundance of people do it. I mean, the number of times that I'm at an event and I get asked, I introduce myself as part of a health company, talk about the product, and somebody says, and so you run marketing? I'm the CEO, and it takes a little while sometimes for them to get that through. It's like you can read my mind because that was a perfect segue into my next question, um, <laughs> which is, as an entrepreneur, regardless of gender, you're expected to wear many hats. You're the CEO, you're marketing, you're sales, um, you're recruiting. But as a female, you also kind of wear this label of female founder. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you carry that title, what it means to you, and how you're um, leveraging it to encourage other women to um, join the ranks. Um, Maki, let's start with you. Yes, yeah, so I think I'm very comfortable being female founder because I've done it three times. Um, but now, this time, I'm, I'm CEO for the first time. I've been um, kind of, um, my co-founder was more visible uh, previously, and I decided to take myself this challenge to be leading this company and to be more visible. And uh, I declared that to myself and to the world. Um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, so this is my first startup. And I think that, you know, I'm very proud to be a female founder. Um, I think there's not really a ton of us even today, um, you know, in terms of the other founders and investors who I uh, communicate with regularly, I think just because of sheer number, they just are still all male, which is something that I, I want to change, but I just don't really have as much opportunity to meet female founders, which, um, you know, is, is disappointing in a lot of ways. Um, and I think as a female founder, um, because you don't have as many, you're, there's not as many of you in a way, I think at times I especially earlier on, I did feel imposter syndrome. Like I think I was, you know, sometimes I felt a little bit like shy telling people, oh, I'm CEO, um, because I felt like, oh, my business, it's not, you know, it's not ma making enough revenue yet to really be considered like a big company, I'm a big CEO. But, and instead I just kind of took a step back and thought to myself like, why am I holding myself back? Like, why do I have this imposter syndrome? Like I should just be proud of it. Um, so I think one thing that I started to really do was, you know, really look up to other, you know, female founders, uh, whether I knew them personally or, you know, just kind of heard about them from afar and, you know, just started listening to their stories and seeking inspiration from them. And, um, you know, and, and I'm, I also want to meet more female founders as well because I think it was kind of a lonely journey um, at times, especially in the beginning. Um, and I think being a founder in itself is already pretty lonely a lot of times because you're literally just building your own company from the ground up. But I think especially being a female founder, um, if you don't know any other female founders, it, it, um, you know, it can be hard. Yeah, I guess I'd never really thought of myself as a female founder. I thought of myself as a founder. And I don't know if it... Uh, I don't know if it works for or against me. I mean, I did have to start learning that they, a lot of the things we're talking about, about network effects, et cetera. Um, I do want to comment on the, the loneliness because you know the CEO is the, the most lonely position in a company. Um, so incubating at a place like GSV was a big ad for us. That was a huge help to kind of have social structure, have other entrepreneurs around, um, see companies that were growing through their phases, you know, at different phases. So that was a really good way to help combat some of that. Um, and then, of course, there are networks, growing networks for the female founders. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that was asked earlier about what can men do to help, um, I'd just like to share a story from a recent allergy conference we were at, and one of our future board members was there with, there with me. Guy comes up and introduces, you know, introduces himself. And I had said to him earlier in the meeting, I said, you realize everybody's going to walk up and think I'm your wife. I've had, had that experience. I was at a award show with my former CEO. We were winning a World Technology Award. And they almost pushed one of the, uh, when we went up to receive the award, one of the, the referees held me back from going up on the stage. <laughs> Literally. Uh, so my CEO had to jump in and say, what? no, she's, she's our chief strategy officer. Of course she's coming up with me. 
Um, but like in this event I was just talking about, this quad AI event, the doctor that walked up and talked to him just assumed I was a sidekick, and he didn't proactively introduce me. He didn't proactively say, oh, by the way, she's got the hot, this is the CEO of this te technology company. You really need to go see it. So I'm kind of standing there like this going, I eventually broke in, but just being cognizant of the fact that particularly in networking events, networking tends to divide along male boundaries and where you do have female colleagues, reach out, reach out to the women in the room. Um, also reach out to help your colleagues with those kind of introductions. It is much appreciated and usually necessary. Something to that point, um, I'm curious about your perspectives on this. Um, there's been kind of a boom of content recently, um, kind of challenging the Silicon Valley Boys Club, if you will. Um, Lean in, how to be successful without hurting men's feelings, um, those books. Um, while they do kind of bring to the surface these feelings in these uh, events, um, I, I feel like it's mostly women reading these books, so how can we encourage more men to kind of get out, address the issue, talk about it? Um, Hanmei, I'll start with you. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think honestly just having events like this one um, and actually holding diversity um, workshops like in, in various offices or corporations so that you know both men and women need to attend um, and just get a sense for what could they be doing in the workplace to um, make sure that everyone feels included. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I'm actually in Skydeck uh, right now, UC Berkeley as well, and uh, what I really like about them is they've held actually two uh, workshops recently about, uh, about diversity, because right now we have around 20 cohort teams, and I think only three of them have female founders, so it was something pretty important for them to bring up. I think sa I said some of my ideas along those lines. It's just part of it is raising awareness. Part of it, is, I mean, I'm thrilled. Usually, when I come to these panels for women, it's an entirely female audience. Yeah. So, the, mm -hmm. I mean, the representation here today is fantastic. We appreciate your support and your interest in this. Um, so, yeah, just just raising awareness, being conscious, mm -hmm. um, and thinking about the networks. Really thinking about how you cross build networks. I think is an important step. I'm very positively surprised. I mean, look at the ratio. I didn't expect this. It's wonderful. Um, I think also one of the keys is to have a male ally um, with us um, so that we can have bigger wave and uh, um, to be more inclusive and maybe to support each other out loud um, that we can get so much you know, energy from these wars and to feel that we are not only ones um, so we need more representation, and I think we more we need more support from uh, uh, males, um, so that um, we can have bigger push um, towards uh, uh, our goal. Yeah, and I mean this point about breaking up the boys' club. Um, I'm in Med Device, so yeah, you kind of experience it. You go to Wilson Sincini's Med Device event, and I have never been an event. It's been years since I've been an event that had like ten women in the room when you've got two hundred people. It was, I mean it kind of blew me away when I first attended. Um, advocacy, so it's, you know, I've noticed um, some of my upcoming investors and my current investors, my female ones tend to advocate more for us. Um, my male investors will tend to send a note of intro and call it a day. So I think that that kind of advocacy is also very helpful. Um, I would generalize that to workplace in general. Um, and it's not just a women-led thing because I think in any company you're gonna see sort of clicks around, that around um, all types of diversity issues. So just being aware of individual advocacy is another step. Um, next, I'd like to steal one of Susie's questions, because um, I think it, it'd be an interesting comparison to hear from the VC panelists that we talked to today, as well as our, our founders. Um, so on a scale of one to 10, how would you grade the current resources and support landscape for female-led companies, and what active steps do we need to take as a community to improve? Um, I think I'll give two. <laughs> Sorry, it's really low. I'm in automotive industry. <laughs> um, I've seen better. Uh, I think Israel is much more progress uh, in this sense. Um, and... Um, 
I truly feel that women, we also we need to support each other and not compete with each other. Uh, there are not limited number of space available. We can increase a number. Um, again, I think to support each other out loud is very, very important. Um, like the other day for um, International Women's Day, um, Forbes Japan wrote an article about me and potential women in Japan. And um, I got so many negative comments, like who the hell do you think that she can do it in this automotive and aerospace field? But this woman uh, reached out to me, um, and just some comments, it just lifted me up and energized me so much, and I could you know, get up and do it again. So I think every support is so important, and just say out loud, and I think we should open doors more to each other, um, make introduction, and yeah, just act on it. I would rate it a five and it's because I feel like every year there are more and more resources available for for female founders uh, whether it's like online communities or uh, female co-working spaces or female founders office hours um, you know I, I do see it improving over time which is great but it still does have a long way to go I one thing that has been interesting to me is I think when I do speak to other female founders or investors. I don't think they've been quite as um, like aggressive with introducing me to people. I, I think for some, for whatever reason, I think it's mostly, um, you know, in terms of like my advisors and, and other people in my community, the ones who have actually stepped up and helped me the most have, um, have been male so far. And I'm not really sure, sure why. It could just be because of, you know, because I know more of them than, than you know, females. But I think one thing that we could all do a bit better is to, uh, m is to actually not just support each other like emotionally, but also like help each other professionally. Like if you, if you meet a female, fa if you meet someone and you know someone who you think could be a great connection for them, like go, go make that connection. Don't just kind of be passive and say nothing. Um, that's just something that I've, I've noticed. Numeric scale rating. Um, I think the early stages are getting pr reasonably good. Um, you know, you have organizations like Astia that will invest and Portfolio that are looking to invest. And um, those are just a couple of the local ones. Golden Seeds is a later stage. They're angels, but they're a later stage one. But they do open up the office hours and things like that. Um, and as they've been considering investing, I'm finding them to be incredibly proactive on our behalf um, in terms of rounding rounding people up. Um, later stage, you know, you still do kind of look at, okay, the Silicon Valley in particular networks, you know, they work, you have to have a warm introduction. Well, how do I get a warm introduction <laughs> if, it's, if everything is based around your basic networks? Um, so I think some of the things, I would reinforce some of the things you're saying about us proactively working on each other's behalf. Um, the other thing I noticed is there's a lot of data on women being very task-oriented, task-driven, which means sometimes we don't come up for air to go to the networking events, or we don't come up for air to go hang out or to invite somebody out for coffee and just say, hey, I'd just like to pick your brain a little bit um, and start to build those relationships. And those are, those can be go come, um, extremely important, not only for the emotional support you get out of them, because it's fun to go out and talk to somebody about the business and say, hey, I'd like to bounce some ideas around. Um, but it also is, they become your lifeline, they can become your lifelines when you're in trouble or when you're really down on, you know, when you're really low on the financing or when you need help um, getting out of the mud mm -hmm. for whatever reason. So I just encourage us to invest in that network side of things. And it's okay to say, hey, you want to grab a coffee sometime. Thanks. And we're, we're coming up on time, so I want to um, have one question, and then I'll open it up for the audience. Um, but my last question is twofold. Um, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever gotten? Um, and then what advice would you give other budding founders? The worst. It's very difficult to pick. <laughs> 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 Step down from uh, your position, or um, I think... Um, where are your children or whatever? Anyway, so um, maybe <laughs> at the conference, um, um, I said, where are your children? That's something. 
at the conference that I was at. Anyway, um, I think uh, the worst would be stop doing what you're doing. You're not going to make it. I've been told like 100 times. And having um, a successful exit last time, I know that persistence, that's the key. People who made it didn't give up. Um, I feel that the um, difference between success and failure is so thin. You just, if uh, your business makes sense to you and you believe in it and you just keep on going. Um, it's, it can be tough, like for my first startup, I didn't have any revenue for two years. I had to wait tables at the weekends. Um, that was my only source of income. IQP was worse. Four years, I uh, self-funded everything uh, because no one believed in it until the buzzword IoT came in and everyone wanted to buy like piece of it. Um, so I was told you you're very unlikely to make it. I'm always the unlikely one. I'm the female, I'm the mother, I'm, I don't know, a foreigner, I'm raised by a single mom, whatever. And <laughs> uh, people tell you you're not gonna make it, but if you believe, you just continue and it will happen. So the worst advice I've ever gotten, um, I think actually was around hiring. Um, so the advice was just hire whoever is available, hire whoever's cheapest. And um, the reason why I think that's not good advice is because you really should be selective in hiring, especially for a startup in which every person makes a huge difference. Um, you really should be selective in terms of hiring the person who has the right skills, the right experience, the right commitment, the right, the right culture fit. And you want to hire them so that they actually stay with your, with your company in the long run and you invest in them as a person with all the onboarding and training. And you know, so I, I think that was um, you know, not, good of, not good advice in my opinion. And in terms of the best advice um, you know, for a startup, and I really admire what you said actually about bootstrapping for so long because we, we also bootstrapped for, for around um, a year and a half. And the, the biggest thing about that was sales. Like sales really is the lifeline. Like you must pay attention to sales. And I think that that's so important because even if you have like a beautiful website, you have the top engineers, you have a ton of VC funding, if you're not selling anything, then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, so I think just having an obsession with sales and making sure that you know, you're making your customers happy and you're um, really listening to their feedback is, is super important. Yeah, I was trying to think about the worst piece of advice. I mean, we all hear the it's going to fail thing, and that's, I mean, the odds are we, wa the odds are we are. Um, that's, that's what the statistics tell us. Um, so, yeah, perseverance, I agree with you 100%. Um, another learning for me the first time around was about hiring to the trajectory because in a startup, the job responsibility grows faster than people can grow into the job. So we tried to hire, in, in my first company, we tried to hire the, you know, the cheap, we tried the junior people who could be groomed, and I realized I didn't have time to groom them. I just didn't have that bandwidth. So um, thinking about building the company and building it to the trajectory that you want to be on um, is one of the things I've taken with me for this company. And then I guess the other is a um, piece of advice my mom gave me, there's always room for the best. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, so now I'd like to open it up for questions uh, from the audience. I can keep going. <laughs> um, your stories are super inspiring. Thank you for sharing them with us. Um, so on the flip side, there are stories like Theranos, right? Um, and I was wondering how they've helped or hurt what's happening with female founders in Silicon Valley. And what can we do, what more can we do to bring out stories like yours, which are around us, but we just don't do enough? So just wondering what your thoughts are about that. My motto is I never say no, say yes. Like this event, I was invited for this event last Friday, I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll figure out later. Yes, say yes and do it. And you'll, fi you'll think about it later and you know the way. If you fail, then don't worry about it. You just found another way that doesn't work. Um, yeah, action. <laughs> I think you should be willing to pivot 
if it's necessary. I mean, if you have a product and no one likes it, it's not working, um, nobody's buying it, maybe you have a good idea, maybe you're onto something, but you may just need to tweak it a little bit. Like maybe you need to tweak um, the business model, maybe you need to tweak the technology. Um, but I think, especially in the early days like that, flexibility to really listen to your customers and really um, kind of make sure that what you're building really works and uh, will make like a positive difference um, in you know whether you're selling it to businesses or direct to consumer. Um, I think I think that's very important and also being willing to listen to advice um, because if something's not working, you need to be willing to do experiments and see what does work the best. Uh, yes, specifically with regard to Th Theranos, um, my board is getting a lot more scrutiny, I think, than it would have at another time. <laughs> 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 um, in terms of fallout for females, I don't know if it's hurt or helped us. Um, you know, there are there are companies that go down in flames that are led by men too. Uh, so you know, there's there's going to be both flip sides. I think investors know. I mean, investors know that they're usually looking though for somebody that they can really feel like. Um, this is one difference for me in this particular company is my last company was public from the time we were founded. So eight people, we were on the listed market. Our investors were all financial. So they weren't really trying to help us build, get in and build the company. Um, this time around, as I'm going through this kind of early stage, really working it, um, I'm appreciating the support I can get from my investors. And so I'm really learning firsthand the meaning of, of find those allies, find those partners, find the right investors, um, having a few property managers, real estate people, doctors on board doesn't, doesn't hurt. Uh, those are some deep pockets that you can also <laughs> reach out to, even if they're not really directly helping you build the business. Uh, as females, just wondering if it's, um, hard for you guys to find a co-founder and if you have any advice for other uh, females looking for the right co-founder in terms of finding one. So in my case, um, for all these three companies, my co-founder is the same guy. He's my husband. <laughs> 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 and I'm really lucky to have him because he's um, wonderful in a way that um, I think we have mutual admiration that I would like to see him successful and he is the same. Um, so I've never had problem finding the co-founder. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually a solo founder right now and it has, you know, I have thought about, oh, should I get a co-founder, in particular a technical co-founder because maybe that would just make my life easier. But honestly, I just haven't really found, the right person hasn't really come along, but I also haven't really been actively looking. Um, I think that if, I mean, I, I, it's not a role where you want to just fill it with anyone. It's something where if you find the right person or if you're actively looking um, because you need one, um, then you can go for it, but I'm not just going to give it to anyone. And I think uh, we are late stage enough where if someone joined at this point, maybe I would have them be like a CTO or something on the C-suite instead. Um, I know other companies, maybe they, I mean, I would definitely consider having a co-founder, but it's not something that I've been actively looking for. Yeah, it doesn't sound like you needed it. <laughs> and at this point, it's not, yeah. you, you, you wouldn't bring someone in as a founder. Um, I can't say, I, I haven't had trouble, no. Um, I've been able to recruit people with a vision of what I want to do. Um, we've had people refer. Uh, one of the things I will do is when I'm fairly focused on what I need, I, I need a head of research. I really need to find somebody for the head of research is I just put that word out there and I keep talking about it. And I ended up with a chief scientific officer now who is uh, UCSF pedigree. He brings so much credibility, neuroimmunologist by background. Um, same thing happened with marketing, you know, just as I'm talking to people and somebody, somebody, some ENT asked me, do you need a marketing person by any chance? And it turns out I was able to get the one person who launched the very first electrotherapy product <laughs> into the US over the counter. Um, so I don't know if it's you know, forces of the universe kind of stuff or just really being deliberate and specific about what you're looking for in 
at any given time. But I should say, in general, no. Um, people have resonated with me. They've resonated with my leadership. They've resonated with my vision for the company. And the fact I'm female just is kind of a kind of hasn't been a factor for anybody that I would want to be hiring. I think we probably have time for one more. I have the mic over here. Um, so I'm sure it's a slightly different for each of you, but I'm curious um, if you would identify yourselves as being born with an entrepreneurial spirit or if it's something you learned over time or perhaps something you stumbled upon because you just came across a great idea. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had the good fortune. I was working at Xerox Park, which is an advanced technology research lab for a number of years and seeing technology kind of out, getting out into the market. Um, and my job was pushing it in different ways. So I built teams and I built, but I didn't think of myself as entrepreneurial by any means. Um, and then I started working with one of my client companies and saw this could be really cool. I could, and I got to, I got to work with and be mentored by a CEO that had built $2 billion companies before. So that was a pretty cool opportunity. Um, but I didn't ever think of myself as entrepreneurial in that sense. Um, it was definitely something that was learned um, exposure, seeing other people do it, and then saying, um, I, had a, I had a manager at one point who said, my goal, her goal, was to become the CEO of a startup. And at the time, it sounded so weird to me because she was on such a trajectory up her career path. And I remember that resonating later. It was like, you know, I was out of work. I, I had left a company. We were at a good point, but I, the CEO and I had different visions for the company. Um, I'd done okay, so I could take time to find something. And while I was looking to get back in and do it again, because building the company was so much fun, um, that's when I, this opportunity came up. I got introduced to the technology. I hunted down the inventor. And things just kind of came from there, came together. I definitely grew into it. Um, I think that I'm not the type of person who would do a startup just for the sake of doing a startup. I think I did a startup because I was really passionate about what I'm building. And I remember even in college, because I, I was a business major and we would hear about all these different career tracks, everything from finance to entrepreneurship. And I, I was never, I never really hopped on the entrepreneurship bandwagon because at that time I didn't really have any like startup idea. So um, I, w I thought I would kind of go down more of a structured, like typical career path. And I think I'd always done well in structured environments. Like I could see myself, even today, like I, I still could in some way see myself in like a corporate desk job and being happy. But, um, but, but you know, it's actually, you know what? Never, now that I think about it, not, not as, I think before I did this, I would have been, but now I think I'm too, I, I'm so accustomed to just having um, you know, I'm, I'm in charge of like marketing and product development and, 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 you know, product management and sales and, you know, basically almost everything. And it is really fun to be able to kind of, you know, it's your vision that you're bringing to life. So, but I think before that I did, um, you know, feel, I did feel lo like a lot of comfort in a structured environment. So I think it, w it may have been a little bit of a surprise to like a few of my friends that I ended up becoming, um, you know, a startup founder. But it was something that I grew into, and I think you absolutely can, especially if you love what you're doing, and especially if you are super passionate and really, really believe in your mission and your product, and you especially like you know hire the right people to work with you. Um, I, I think that drive will just kind of push you, and um, you know, you. I, I think that that anyone can learn to become an entrepreneur even if you don't really, even if you weren't like, you know, 10 years old and making your, like, you know, like making money at Lemonade Stand or, you know, doing anything that maybe um, people who've known they want to be entrepreneur their whole lives do. I definitely wasn't that and here I am now. So, no, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> But I think I had uh, great role models. Um, um, starts from uh, my grandma. Um, she was an entrepreneur. Um, after the war that Japan didn't have anything, she had her own business. And I saw her, how she sustained the business until the age of like 70. She was a bold person. And I saw my mom as a carrier woman as well. 
And uh, but I think I was always stubborn. I if I um, I went with my gut feeling. Um, if I felt that it's the right thing, I would do it. Like I left Japan when um, after finishing high school to UK because I wanted to study um, psychology. And uh, um, everyone said no, no, don't do it. But I went for it. And after that, uh, I found one um, professor in Israel um, doing cool research. And I say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go uh, to Israel to do my master's. And of course, everyone will say, why, why, why Israel? <laughs> but I say, I went for it, and it was great. And I saw um, in Israel great examples of all these entrepreneurs who are not afraid. Um, and I saw that, OK, they can do it. Maybe I can do that, too. So I think definitely I learned it. Um, for those that are thinking about it, I think there's this idea that entrepreneurs are risk takers. And the best entrepreneurs are risk reducers. So we really focus on, okay, what's the biggest risk in the equation and what do I need to take to do to get rid of that risk one piece at a time? So uh, there's even, from when I stand at the company, there's a whiteboard still in my office that has like my, you know, what are the milestones that matter? What are the very, very first things I have to do to get this thing fundable? That was patents and data. <laughs> Two things I knew I had to get done. Um, so just think about that. I mean, if you're thinking about you want, would I feel comfortable in the startup environment? It's very unstructured. You, you do everything. And then bit by bit, you grow, and it creates structure. And, and it's kind of this really cool organic thing that happens as it, it turns into something bigger. Um, and you have people around you, and they're doing stuff. So. Don't be fearful. It's really just take that idea, reduce the risk a piece at a time, and, and just work through it. Thank you all so much again for Thank joining us. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And I think Kate's going to come up and do a quick closing, and then we'll have our networking and happy hour. Yeah. Can we get another round of applause for all the panelists and the moderators? <laughs> Um, thank you so much for being here again. Um, if you ever Google all-male panel, uh, this really great stream comes up of people making fun of, of all-male panels. And we uh, had a lot of fun putting on this event and kind of swinging it back the other way. Um, but please stay. We have food rolling in right now. Um, we have more drinks over here. And kind of with the theme of the night, make those valuable connections and introductions. Um, and the more we can lift each other up here, the better world it's going to be. So thanks for being here. Thank you.